Good day to everyone joining us and welcome to today's X Talks webinar. Today's talk is entitled, How Rodent and NHP Models Support COVID-19 Treatment Development. My name is Sonia Hunt and it's my pleasure to be your X Talks moderator for today. Today's talk will run for approximately 60 minutes. This presentation includes a Q&A session with our speakers. This webinar is designed to be interactive and webinars work best when you're involved. So please feel free to submit questions and comments for our speakers throughout this presentation by using the questions chat box and we'll try to attend to your questions during the Q&A session. Now, this chat box is located in the control panel and that's found on the right hand side of your screen. If you require assistance, please contact me at any time by sending me a message using that chat panel. At this time, all participants are in listen-only mode. Please note that this event will be recorded and made available to you for future streaming on xtalks.com. At this point, I'd like to thank Onco Design, who developed the content for this presentation. Onco Design is a biopharmaceutical company dedicated to precision medicine, founded in 1995 by its current CEO and majority shareholder. Its mission is the discovery of effective therapies to fight cancer and other diseases without therapeutic solutions. With its unique experience acquired by working with more than 1,000 clients, including the world's largest pharmaceutical companies, along with its unique technological platform combining artificial intelligence, state-of-the-art medicinal chemistry, pharmacology, regulated bioanalysis, and medical imaging, Onco Design is able to select new therapeutic targets and design and develop potential preclinical candidates through two clinical phases. Now it's my pleasure to introduce you to your speakers for today's webinar. And first, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Nicola Legrand. Uh, he's in Vivo Lab and Study Unit Director at Onco Design. Dr. Nicola Legrand holds an MSc and a PhD in Immunology from Pierre and Marie Curie University Institute Pasteur in Paris. He worked at the Academic Medical Center in Amsterdam from 2003 until 2010 as a research scientist, scientific advisor, and finally co-investigator on the Human Vaccine Consortium project founded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Now it's my pleasure to introduce you to your second speaker. He is Dr. Roger Legrand. He is a veterinarian and holds an MSc in cell biology and a PhD in immunobiology from the University of Paris. In 1996, he joined the French Alternative Energies and Atomic Energy Commission as permanent senior scientist through to his current position as the head of infectious disease models for innovative therapies department. Now, before I pass over the mic to our first speaker, Nicola, uh, we do have our first poll question for our audience members to engage in, and I'm going to launch it now. Now, this is done in real time, so your participation is strongly encouraged and very much appreciated, because once we've um, launched the polls here and you've cast your votes, I will close the polls and we'll take a look at the results. Okay, so the question that we have for you is a very easy one. What type of products are you willing to evaluate in COVID-19 in vivo model? So you have four options below. So please go ahead and click on the ones that apply to you. Uh, a for vaccine, biologics, antibodies. Uh, the next one is small molecules, MCE, or other. Okay, it looks like we have the majority of our audience have cast their votes, but there's a few people out there that have not. So I'm gonna wait a few more seconds to allow you to go ahead and cast your votes now, because we all want you to be, all, we all want to participate in this. Okay, perfect. That looks like it's everyone. Thank you so much, everyone, for participating in our first poll question. Now I'm going to close the polls and share the results. Okay, so here's the results of our poll question. We have 17% of our audience is saying vaccines, 28% of our audience is saying biologics, antibodies, and then we have another 44% saying small molecules, NCE, and then only 11% that are saying other. So thank you very much, everyone, for participating in our first poll question. Now it's my pleasure to pass over the mic and the controls over to our first speaker, Nicola. So Nicola, when you're ready, please go ahead and begin. Thank you, Sonia, and hi, everyone. Um, as Sonia introduced, basically the, the webinar today will be cut in two parts, and uh, I'll be uh, driving you through the first part that will deal mostly with the relevant models before Roger talks about the NHP models in the second part of the webinar.
So first few words around the, the work of Hunger Design uh, uh, on SARS-CoV-2. We've been actually quite active in the field for uh, more than a year now. Um, establishing a portfolio of, of models uh, in different uh, approaches uh, to deal with um, the fight against SARS-CoV-2 and that has been done uh, also uh, in conjunction with uh, two major partners. Um, it admits that uh, uh, Roger is heading actually uh, for everything dealing with uh, primate work and more recently we have also um, been in involved with work with the, another French uh, institution called CIF, CIF. Uh, for work linked to uh, humanized mouse models, which I will also in briefly introduce at the end of my uh, presentation. So the toolbox we have developed basically is relatively large. We have, of course, um, in vitro assays that uh, help us to understand how the virus can be uh, engaged by different type of therapeutic approaches. Um, and that deals uh, with uh, different uh, cellular systems that support uh, the, the replication of the virus that I won't go through uh, today, and, and a variety also of in vivo models. Uh, and as I just mentioned, um, the first part of that webinar will deal with mostly hamster models and mouse models, and Roger will then address the non-human primate models. So now let's start directly with the first of those models, the golden Syrian hamster. Um, this is a model that is actually uh, widely used now. It has been uh, already um, used in the past for the SARS-CoV virus so 15 years ago. Um, and at the time, people uh, realized that this uh, family of uh, viruses uh, could infect effectively um, hamsters. And that's actually exactly the same for SARS-CoV-2. Um, and what has been reported in the literature uh, and which we have also actually validated is that uh, you indeed observe uh, uh, an inflammation of the airways and the lungs, uh, clinical manifestation associated with weight loss once the animals are infected. Um, and there is, of course, manifestation of, of, um, of interaction between the immune system and, and the virus, uh, such as, for instance, lymphoid atrophy, uh, response uh, in the tissues by different cell types, as well as an adaptive response that will uh, clear the virus over time. So this is a, a, a mild disease model. Um, we don't see usually animals that are so sick that they have to be euthanized, so they usually not, don't reach the ethical uh, uh, limit points. Uh, another interesting point with the hamster is that these uh, animals are known to sneeze and cough, and this is indeed an effective model of transmission between animals. Um, and one other thing that, that's worth mentioning, although it's not uh, really widely uh, characterized, is that um, infection will also affect other anatomical areas than the, the airways, and you can find the virus back or effects of infection on the heart, for instance, or in the brain, uh, which uh, could cause anosmia, as described in the human patients. Um, readouts actually were quite limited in the hamsters, but the situation is slightly changing over time. There are more and more tools available and developed by different uh, providers to work around the immunological manifestation of the disease. And that's, for instance, um, the case with cytokine profiling um, or ELISPOTS. There was no ELISPOTS kit for, for, for the hamsters until the beginning of the year, and now that's, that's the case. Uh, but still, keep in mind that the tools that are available are, of course, much more limited than um, we are used to with mouse models. Now, let's go through some details on the, this model just to give you a flavor on, on how that model works. Um, as I said before, the main clinical sign after infection in hamsters is weight loss. It usually peaks around six days post-infection, and then the animals will start recovering, and uh, around two weeks post-infection, they are usually back to the control levels. Uh, this weight loss is actually quite marked. It can represent 10 to 15% weight loss over a six-day time frame. And this correlates also with the dose of virus that is applied to the animals. Usually the animals are infected via the intranasal uh, route with relatively high doses. It can be 10 to the 5 PFU, but if you reduce that dose, the weight loss will also be reduced. There are microscopic lesions that can be observed on the lungs uh, from usually five days post-infection. The lungs usually appear bigger. There are zones that are obviously uh, a site of high pathology with red brown zones, uh, small red dots all over the surface of the organs, for instance. The, the viremia usually peaks in the lungs around two to three days post infection. We have never, never been able to find back virus in the hamster plasma, so it seems to be relatively restricted to the airways. 
usually turns down then from day three post-infection, usually becomes difficult to detect from day seven post-infection. Uh, this can be actually uh, monitored using different approaches, for instance, QRT-PCR in the tissues to simply detect the viral genome. Or you can also um, evaluate the amount of infectious particles um, using a TCID-50 assay uh, based on cytopathogenic effects that would be induced by um, a tissue homogenate placed on the top of a cell culture that is sensitive to infection. So that's usually done, for instance, with uh, Vero E6 uh, TMPR assays to expressing cells. Um, in time, basically, the, the, the inflammation in lungs is not correlating with the, uh, the kinetics of viral replication, as uh, would be expected. Uh, indeed, it takes time for the pathology to uh, set up and develop. And what we usually observe is that um, the best time point to observe uh, pathology in the lungs is usually around seven days post-infection. Uh, and the pathology will be characterized by three main criteria. It's uh, edema of the lung tissue, inflammation with influx of immune cells, as well as uh, signs of hemorrhage uh, in the tissue. The pathology also correlates with an immune response, as I mentioned in my introductory slide. So for instance, here, one example with the characterization of the cytokine response in the tissues that's um, showing you over time the level of expression that can be seen for different cytokines in the lungs. Uh, and what we usually uh, find is usu the usual suspects, I would say, so a strong response for interferon gamma, IL-21, IL-6, IL-10, with a peak around four days post-infection. Uh, other products will be expressed at uh, lower levels, potentially, and the, the kinetics of expression may vary also from products to products, for instance, for IL-12, the peak would be more around day four to day seven. Uh, for CCL-22, it's around day, two, day seven post-infection. There is not only a cytokine response, but of course also an antibody response that um, uh, turns on uh, after infection. Um, to make a long story short, we have repurposed an uh, MSD um, uh, multiplex ELISA kit that was originally developed for humans and uh, primates uh, to be able to also evaluate the AMSTER IgG responses against the spike, RBD, and the nucleocapsid antigens. Um, and what we usually see is that the response is already very strong against the three antigens from day seven post infection and reaching usually a plateau around day 14. And the, the fact that the response is already high at day seven could explain why we seem to lose viral load also in, in the animals from day seven. Uh, there is not only a response in, in binding, but also in, in terms of neutralization. And once again, this is something that is evaluated um, uh, in the VROE6 TMPRSS2 cells, um, quantifying the cytopathogenic effects that are induced by a live SARS-CoV-2 virus in presence of the serum of the animals. And neutralization is also very obvious from the seven post infections. So the two measurements basically correlate. Now, a few examples to uh, give you an idea of what we have been able to observe over the 40 plus studies that have been performed at OncoDesign since the, over the past uh, year. Uh, the first example is the evaluation of an anti SARS CoV 2 a neutralizing antibody that was already validated um, in vitro. And we could see there that the EC50 was around 15 nanograms per ml with that product. Uh, and when we uh, apply that to uh, hamsters um, with a treatment starting one day before infection and then escalating uh, neutralizing, neutralizing antibody dose, um, there was an obvious uh, inhibition of virus replication with the high dose of the product. And that was true both for the uh, virus load measured by QRT-PCR or by evaluation of uh, the presence of infectious particles in, in the lung tissues. Another example here uh, is uh, the evaluation of a vaccine uh, candidate uh, with a classical prime boost uh, scheme with four weeks interval between the two injections. And the animals were challenged uh, two weeks after the last uh, boost with the vaccine. Animals have been analyzed at three, three days post-infection, um, mostly to focus on the uh, evaluation of the viral uh, load in the animals. And there was another group of animals also uh, analyzed at day seven post-infection. If you remember, that's the optimal time point to look at pathology in the lungs. So the two 
readouts are basically separated there in time. Now, a few um, um, data that uh, we obtained before the challenge. So this is the evaluation here of the IgG response induced by the vaccine. And what we could see is that with the low dose or the high dose vaccine, the response against spike in that example was uh, really high already um, before the boost and maintained after the boost. Um, it was, this was true actually for all the antigens that were tested from the virus. Um, and an, an, another criterion that is important after challenge then is to, to monitor the weight loss once the animals are uh, challenged. And that was also once again ob obvious if you track the purple and the orange lines that uh, vaccinated animals did not lose weight and they actually stick to the controls non-infected animals in blue, which is uh, already a good sign. And we could uh, also uh, confirm that uh, three days post infection with that vaccine candidate, we could not find any virus back basically in the lungs of the animal. So the vaccine was very effective in um, inhibiting the uh, infection and replication of the virus. Now switching to a third example in which uh, the synergy between uh, pegylated interferon alpha and nafamostat uh, which is a structural analog of camostat uh, was uh, evaluated. Uh, so this was done in the scheme that is shown here. And this is actually uh, data that has been recently published uh, with the Norwegian Technology University uh, in the reference that is mentioned here. And what we observe in that um, study is that um, there was a real synergy between the two products. So that's the, the the blue line with the two stars there that really show that once the two products are combined, the, the, the amount of virus that we could find back in the animals was uh, clearly reduced. And when t plaxitilin was uh, also applied to the animals before uh, uh, the infection, we lost that uh, synergy, synergistic effect. And the explanation for that is as follows. So basically, Nafamostat is an inhibitor of TMPRSS2, so the protease that will help for the entry of the virus. Interferon alpha will activate serpin uh, E1, which is also an inhibitor of TMPRSS2, so the two combined will put a strong inhibition on the protease and therefore inhibit the entry of the virus. Tplaxtinin is an inhibitor of serpin E1, so what happens then is that only nafamostat will put inhibition on TMPRSS2, but uh, it seems to be not uh, enough to inhibit the virus anymore. Now, what I've shown to you basically there uh, with this combination of, of, of examples is that uh, hamsters uh, represent a, a model of mild disease of uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection, although it self-resolves. Uh, there is no sign of mortality in the animals over time. Uh, the viral load peaks in the airways between day, day two and day three post-infection, and lung pathology is mostly apparent on day seven post-infection. Uh, the immune response that is induced after infection is multimodal, so we see a cytokine response, uh, an antibody response, as well as T cell response that I didn't show here, but uh, that's also the case. Uh, and we observe full control of the virus within se seven days after infection. Uh, in the examples I've shown you, there are uh, clear signs of effective control of our replication pathology with different products that have been tested. Uh, the most effective ones at the moment that we have tested are antibodies and vaccines, but um, there are for sure small molecule combinations that uh, will prove uh, beneficial as well. Uh, the last uh, piece of my presentation deals with the COVID-19 mouse models. Uh, in the literature, there are actually a large variety of models that have been described uh, over the past uh, year. I will focus today on only one example, and that's the humanized 2 transgenic models. There are also different models available there. And uh, the example I'm going to show today is the, uh, the K18 uh, uh, model. So those animals have also been developed um, uh, more than 15 years ago uh, when the first SARS-CoV uh, infection and pandemic um, uh, was uh, appearing. Um, and at that time, the model was proven to be very interesting because um, uh, it's little model of SARS-CoV infection and that's exactly the same with SARS-CoV-2 once again. Uh, the median survival is around five days after infection in that model. And the clinical outcome is very severe with very strong weight loss and dyspnea uh, and the animals become really weak after infection. 
This is likely, of course, due to the fact that uh, the, the humanized 2 uh, transgene is expressed under uh, a strong promoter, the K18, uh, which will drive the expression not only but uh, in the airways um, of the animals. I have to mention also that this uh, clinical outcome correlates with a strong uh, cytokine response, so it could be even uh, described as a cytokine release syndrome. Uh, and there is blood lymphocyte lymphopenia that is also observed for T cells, B cells, and monocytes. The pathology is not restricted to the airways in that model. There are more and more papers actually describing also impact of the infection in the central nervous system. So the virus can be found back in the brain uh, of the animals. And it might be also that this uh, viral replication in the brain could explain some of the um, uh, problems that we observe in, the, in, in these animals. Uh, it might be, be linked also to the loss of appetite, for instance, which could also explain uh, partly the weight loss that is observed. A few char characteristics of the models um, for you to, to keep in mind. So the, the viral load uh, remains relatively high in that model over time. Uh, the neuropathology that I've mentioned uh, before is indeed apparent in, in that system. Um, and uh, since the model is little, of course, you expect mortality in, in the animals. That's true when you use a high dose of virus. And if you reduce the dose of virus used to infect the animals, you could then have animals that become survivors. Uh, but to put uh, things, let's say, in a very simple uh, schematic uh, summary, the, the model here has a major interest because this is uh, a survival monitoring model. So in a way, it's uh, um, very interesting in a sense that if your products are very effective, you would uh, basically induce survival. And, and if the product is not effective, uh, you should have a group of animals that are all uh, die, dying um, around day five to day six post-infection. I mentioned that the weight loss is very severe, and that's apparent here. Um, in the survivors, uh, what you see, and that's reminiscent of what I've described in the Amster model as well, is that those, those animals, once they have passed the day seven time point, they will start recovering weight uh, as well. Um, and those survivor animals can be coming then very interesting as well to get access to different type of uh, positive control um, samples, for instance, for induction of uh, antibody response and so on. Uh, now, one last case study for you um, to um, to just get an idea on how those K18 mice are used. So the the, the scheme of the study here is re uh, relatively different because, as I mentioned before, the survival of the animals is one major criterion for the uh, evaluation of the efficacy of a product. Uh, and what is usually done then is uh, an early time point, uh, in that case, day four post-infection to monitor the, the viral load and infectious particles and so on. Uh, and we'll, we'll monitor the animals over two weeks just to make sure that um, survival is uh, obtained. So in that example, there was um, a product that has been evaluated with two injections, one just after infection, six hours after infection, and another one five days post-infection. And this is what we observed in that um, study. So um, the test item is in green here, and obviously that product was able to strongly reduce uh, the viral load in the animals, both by QRT-PCR or by TCID-50 evaluation. And the uh, histology that was evaluated at day four did not provide any uh, very strong conclusion. But it might be exactly the same situation than, than the, in the hamsters, that the seven post-infection would be more optimal to evaluate the histopathology in the lungs. And we are simply at the too early time point. Um, and of course, there are no control as animals usually around day seven. So it becomes quite difficult to evaluate that um, um, readout. Now, if you go to a longer time frame in that study, the body weight was monitored. Uh, interestingly, the animals uh, from the test item treated group uh, lost weight or, uh, initially after infection over like two days, and then they recovered really quickly, um, which um, suggested that the product was able to uh, ameliorate the, the behavior of the animals. And that was actually confirmed by clinical scoring of the animals. And I should mention that this clinical scoring is, is an aggregate of different criteria that I mentioned here on that slide. Uh, it was obvious that uh, the treated animals uh, 
did not show any clinical uh, score uh, and maintain a very really low score over the whole uh, time frame of the study. So to conclude on that uh, model, uh, the, the human ACE2 transgenic mouse models develop a severe lethal disease. That's true with that model. That's also true with other models uh, that are uh, published and described, uh, for instance, AC70 from Taconic. Um, the viral load remain relatively high in the airways uh, for a longer uh, time frame, like seven days. And there is a, an overt immune response that is obvious. Uh, uh, which leads to uh, the deterioration of the status of the animals. An effective control of viral replication and, and pathology induction has been observed after treatment um, in, the, in the example I've shown you, and there are more and more examples coming up now to, um, to show that this model is of interest there. Now, to conclude, basically, what I've shown you with the rodent models there is that there are a variety of clinical models and, and different different uh, clinical situations that are covered by those models. Um, and that me that mean that basically depending on the, the therapeutic mode of action of the different molecules that are tested in, in those systems, one might be more interesting than another. It's a question of strategy there. Uh, and I'm happy to discuss that after the, the second part of the, of the presentation. Uh, I will leave you now uh, with Sonia and uh, Roger for the second part of the study. Well, thank you very much, Nicola. And we're going to launch our second and final poll question for our audience members to engage in before we pass it over to Roger. So let's launch that question now. So there is the poll question in front of you. What type of SARS-CoV-2 in vivo model are you mostly interested in at this moment? So we have a couple of options for you to choose from below. Mice, hamsters, non-human primates, or several models. So please go ahead and cast your votes just like before. We are doing this in real time, so I'll be able to share the results with you once we uh, close the polls. So please go ahead and pick from the below, please. Okay, I'm going to leave a few more seconds. For, it looks like a couple more people need a few more seconds to pick their answers, so please go ahead and do so now. Okay, that looks like it's the majority of our audience members. Thank you so much, everyone, for participating in our final poll question. Now, let's take a look at the results. Okay, so here are the results. We have 24% of our audience members are saying mice, 10% of the audience members are saying hamsters, then we have a tie here, 33% for non-human primates and 33% again for several models. So, so thank you very much everyone for participating in our final poll question. Now I'm going to pass over the controls to our final speaker and that is Roger. So Roger, when you're ready, you may begin. Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I will continue by the presentation on the non-human primates. Uh, that has uh, also another model proposed by, we, we proposed with Onco Design for testing vaccines and treatments against the COVID-19. And I will start by uh, this slide emphasizing the value of non-human primates uh, for exploring uh, human infectious diseases and to assess the treatment and the vaccines. The interest here is that the macaques in particular are uh, susceptible to the uh, viruses without the need of adaptation either of the animal uh, by transgenesis, for instance, or adaptation of the pathogen by serial passages in, this, in, the, in the species uh, for another, uh, uh, for the other hand. In addition to that, uh, the use of non-human primates uh, uh, benefits today for a large uh, number of tools for exploring the host response to infections uh, that can be easily adapted from the human uh, assays uh, because of the uh, large cross-reactivity between the human and the macaque determinants, allowing either the use of directly in the non-human primates the uh, products uh, uh, for designed for human use. At IBIT, uh, which is sorry, at IBIT, which is a national infrastructure located close to Paris, we have the mission to develop non-human primate models for evaluating uh, treatments and uh, uh, vaccines. We have a diversity of models that we are already implementing uh, in this facility. We can host at about uh, 
500 non-human primates in BSL2 and BSL3 containment. And I, in addition to that, we have labs and facilities with extended uh, technologies for monitoring infection and treatment, like a, a advanced tool for immunology, for instance, uh, including site of technology, and a advanced tool for in vivo imaging. Uh, and I will illustrate that a bit in the in my previous in my next slides. Uh, we are offering this model to the scientific community through uh, um, international collaborations and through services uh, for fee, uh, and this is perform in cooperation with uh, OncoDesign. We are also benefiting for our unique environment to develop these uh, um, activities. Uh, on, uh, first, we are located at the Atomic Gene Commission with many other infrastructure dedicated for, with, uh, to genomics or to in vivo imaging, uh, with which we collaborate to uh, apply this to human infectious diseases. And we also have teams implemented uh, at the University Hospital uh, uh, in Bicetre, close to our uh, facilities uh, in fontaine uh, uh, um, here, uh, where we uh, can easily uh, translate our research uh, uh, in preclinical models to clinical trials. Uh, in order to guarantee uh, the quality of uh, the data we provide to our partners, uh, in collaboration with OncoDesign, we have implemented a management uh, quality assurance system, uh, which was certified since 2017 uh, now. Uh, and uh, I will now switch to the uh, specific part on the uh, non-human primate for COVID-19. So the uh, non-human primates, in particular in macaques, are complementing uh, the hamster model uh, for uh, the exploring fashion in disease. Uh, this is uh, mainly because the animals are susceptible to infection through the upper and uh, lower respiratory tract. And as I was saying, uh, the uh, macaques has offer a unique opportunity to direct test vaccines, human vaccines or human, or human antibodies against COVID-19, for instance, uh, in the species because of the uh, similarities in the organization of the system and the cross-reactivity of the human and macaque determinants. Here at EBIT, we have working uh, since uh, February 2020 at the implementation of an, a model of infection in Sinomorgus macaque. And this is the data recapitulating of many of our control animals we have exported through the intratracheal and intranasal route to the Wuhan strain of the SARS CoV 2, uh, recapitulating the viral dynamics here in the upper respiratory tract, so in the nasopharyngeal swabs, in tracheal compartment and also in the lead bronc when we look at, for instance, at the bronchial lavage. Interestingly, our animals also became, uh, um, became convalescent uh, with a profile of post response as indicated here by the antibodies, very similar to what observed in human convalescent uh, after exposure to the SARS-CoV-2. We also observe in our animals uh, a a typical uh, uh, inflammatory responses, uh, which also characterize uh, the SARS-CoV-2 infection in humans. So we can uh, follow part of the inflammation consequences of the infection in this model. And we are continuing to try to adapt the model we are using to the evolution of the pandemics. Uh, and as illustrated here, we are uh, now, avail now capable of proposing models for the uh, variants of concern of the beta, uh, gamma, and, and, and delta strains. At IMIT, we have uh, a very uh, uh, unique activity, capacities for doing uh, in vivo imaging. These uh, strategies allow to monitor for infection and disease and lesions uh, in the animals in BSL3 uh, containment with minimal intervention uh, in the animals. And we are using these for tuberculosis, pertussis, influenza, and of course for the SARS-CoV-2. And, uh, and our animals here are, uh, uh, and this is illustration of what we observe in, in our animals. So the macaques we are using are in the majority of the cases, young adults. And like uh, uh, 
the majority of the human being exposed to the source of two, uh, what is observed here by, uh, uh, by a CT scan uh, when we do a chest analysis uh, in, in the camera is a moderate uh, type of lesions we can monitor over time and try to use this to look at the impact of the treatment uh, and the vaccine during this period. In some uh, very rare cases, our animals may also develop a very severe pneumonia, uh, which is also possible to monitor by these approaches. And we can combine these with the positron emission tomography, uh, allowing to look at, to go deeper in the investigation, look at activated uh, and inflammatory cells uh, that uh, have an increased uptake of the glucose, we can fluorinate this glucose and practice uptake in the different tissues over time. And what you can see here are the tissues uh, that have um, um, these uh, uh, inflammatory lesions uh, in the animals. And also you can monitor the immune activation when look at here, for instance, the spleen uh, and uh, char characterized by the immune activation we have in the animals. We use this model to look at different strategies for preventing the COVID-19 in the non-human primates. Uh, and many of the uh, uh, strategies we tested from the very beginning are the use of uh, repurposed drugs or monoclonal antibodies. The, uh, the major illustration we have is the use of hydroxychloroquine and from the very beginning of the pandemics uh, in April uh, 2020, we were able to communicate to the community that the hydroxychloroquine, whatever the dose we use, whatever the experimental setting as a pre-exposure or post-exposure prophylaxis, and whether we use this in combination or not with the ivitromycin, uh, does not impact the viral replication in the non-human primate, allowing the clinicians to um, uh, base the decision uh, uh, on the continuing the clinical trials on the first results. And this absence of activity was uh, observed in spite of the fact that the concentration of the molecule in the lung, and particularly in the deep lung, was uh, quite high uh, in the animals. So it indicated that indeed the absence of efficacy was not due to uh, um, uh, a, 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 a defect in the biodistribution of the molecule. The most potent activities we have on service so far are related uh, uh, to the use of uh, monoclonal antibodies, and this is one of the very recent publications we had in Nature Communication, where animals were pre-treated with the monoclonal antibodies by intravenous route and exposed to the virus, and you can see that this pre-treatment uh, with the uh, neutralizing monoclonal antibodies really do use significantly the uh, viral replication here in blue in the treated animals compared to the controlled animals here uh, in, uh, uh, in black, and these uh, uh, in different compartments. We were also collaborating uh, with teams here in Paris, and particularly the group of Jeremy Gage at INSERM, to try to model the PKPD um, um, of uh, these monoclonal antibodies and drugs in the non-human primates, so allowing us to better characterize the, the dose effect uh, of the molecules and try to predict uh, the best dose to use in future uh, preclinical and clinical settings. And finally, we were contributing significantly to the evaluation of new vaccines. Uh, and I will just detail a few of them, try to make an illustration of the capacities we have here at IMIT for doing this kind of approaches. So this is a, this is a, um, a work we published in Cell uh, a, early in 2021 uh, with the collaborators at Amsterdam. They were, uh, the idea was to immunize animals with nanoparticles exposing the stabilized spike. Uh, and the animals were injected uh, with uh, this molecule three times uh, um, with a very classical scheme for immunization. The animal developed uh, very nice antibody uh, responses that neutralized the viruses, uh, including the live viruses and uh, uh, tested uh, culture assays. And uh, animals, when they were exposed to uh, the SARS-CoV-2 uh, by our um, uh, developed approach, uh, were significantly uh, protected uh, from viral replication uh, when compared to the control. So you have here in uh, blue the animals that were vaccinated and in gray the controls and you can see that uh, we have significant control of the viral replication in the 
uh, upper respiratory tracts in the mesial compartment and also in the boncoverola lavage. And this was performed by two different approaches by quantification of the genomic viral RNA or the quantification of the subgenomic uh, viral RNA. And finally, the last approach we were uh, evaluating to emphasize how we can use the model for future developments. Uh, you, th there is a, probably um, uh, um, a risk and evolution uh, uh, of the pandemics towards uh, a seasonal uh, 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 epidemics uh, uh, of uh, COVID-19. And then we will face the fact that we will need to re-immunize people that maybe have been exposed to the virus uh, before uh, through infection or exposed to the viral antivention previous vaccination with other approaches. So we can use the Nokiman parameter to assess this, and this is an illustration where an antibody fused with the antigens were used to target these antigens to the dendritic cells. And the injection of, an, uh, of these antibodies by the cutaneous route uh, one, with one single shot uh, uh, in convalescent uh, uh, macaques have induced indeed a significant level of antibodies, antibodies that neutralize the viruses, and these antibodies were able to significantly improve the control here in green, uh, the, uh, um, the immunity uh, in the, uh, the, the virus uh, in the animals as compared to the uh, only convalescent animals with no immunization here in blue or the uh, control animals with no previous exposure to the SARS-CoV-2. So just to teasing you on what we are developing for the future, so we were working on the uh, uh, development of uh, systems and tools for nebulization and aerosols. The idea is to use these approaches to model, to, to better model the transmission of pathogens through aerosols uh, to the animals, and also to use these uh, approaches to deliver the treatments uh, to the respiratory tract uh, at different levels. Uh, uh, and this is uh, becoming available pretty soon uh, in our facility. So with this, I will finish here. I will uh, uh, thank uh, my collaborators at IMIT, uh, who has a very large, huge contribution to the development of these models. And of course, all our international partners um, using this model with us uh, for the evaluation of the project. And finally, I would like to thank the funders uh, uh, of, our, uh, of our activities. Thank you very much for your attention and we'll be happy to answer your questions. Well, first of all, I'd like to say thank you very much, Roger and Nicolas, for that very insightful presentation. I hope everyone enjoyed it. We're going to put on our webcams now, so I'll invite Roger and Nicolas to put on their webcams as we begin the Q&A portion of the webinar. So just a reminder to our audience members, you can send in your questions by using that questions window that is located on the right-hand side of your screen. And we'll try to attend to your questions during the time that we have together. So while Nicola and Roger were speaking, I did receive a bunch of questions from our audience members. So I'm gonna start with those. Um, so let's begin. So Nicola and Roger, are you ready? Yes. Okay. All right. Here's our first question. Uh, this audience member is asking, have certain types of products proven to be more effective than others in the rodent or NHP models? Who would like to start with that one? I can already provide some uh, insight of when we have basically uh, been applying all type of products in, in those models. And for mm -hmm. sure, and as Roger mentioned, uh, Monoclonal antibody products as well as vaccines have been the most effective so far. Uh, there has been a, quite a lot of disappointment with the first repurposed drugs that have been tested alone or in combination in, in these models. Mm -hmm. uh, but that does not mean that those products would not be available at some point. So I think it's just a matter of time. Um, and as well, I should mention that not all vaccine candidates, of course, are effective. Not all antibodies are effective. So we basically observe um, a large uh, pattern of possibilities when we apply those products uh, from non-effective to effective and uh, some of those are actually also intermediary effective in a way so that's where it becomes sometimes tricky to evaluate uh, the efficacy of some of those products mm -hmm. okay um, did Roger, you have anything to add yeah i can continue with the yeah. uh, uh of uh, nicola about the uh, uh, the how uh, uh, valuable are this model, how complementing are this model uh, for the evaluation of uh, molecule candidates. So uh, what, there, there was no 
clear uh, um, the discrepancies between the use of answers and the use of document formats so far for many of, of, of the products. However, in terms of methodology, we have to be careful in order to carefully assess in this species the uh, PK, uh, so the pharmacokinetics of the products uh, and the biodistribution of the products before uh, we go uh, into uh, into evaluation of the uh, efficacy uh, of the products. And then most of the discrepancies we have also so far are related to the fact that uh, there was not a properly adapted uh, experimental settings uh, between the models. So it's very important that uh, we enter into collaboration with our partners very early in the development to characterize the biodistribution and to characterize the uh, um, the, um, the pharmacokinetics of the products before we test uh, these molecules in the two clinical models. Okay, well, thank you very much, Roger, for adding to that. All right, let's go on to our next question. Uh, this audience member is asking, what are the usual issues that you should be uh, anticipated when preparing an in vivo SARS-CoV-2 study? Who would like to start with that one? Uh, I can start. Um, okay. the, I th usually, so the, the, the anticipation is a key, I would say. Uh, so it basically takes time to set up all those studies. Uh, it takes time to get access to a slot for in vivo work uh, because the, the level of demand, as you can imagine, has been extremely high over the past uh, year and a half. Um, and obviously, if you want to articulate some of those models together, this has also to be well planned, basically. Uh, more and more, if you want to enter to NHP studies, it will usually be required that you provide some prior data from Rodent, uh, just to demonstrate at least some level of efficacy. Um, and as Roger mentioned before, the, the biodistribution and PK features of those products are actually quite important. Mm -hmm. um, we need to make sure also that there is no uh, toxicity issues, for instance, with those products when applied to animals. So th there are a lot of preparatory steps that need to be um, thought about quite carefully uh, before you, you go to the challenge part, basically, with the virus, which is, of course, the most heavy part of the work um, due to many constraints linked to the work in uh, level three facilities for airborne pathogens. So with uh, very specific safety issues. Um, so all together means that these projects are usually quite long and um, they need to be well planned. Um, so, uh, Roger, I know. You, would you like to add? I know you always have something to add. <laughs> yeah, I always have something to add, actually. But uh, <laughs> at this point, I think as uh, Nicolas said, everything. So, and I mm -hmm. agree that they. In fact, there is no specific issue, so we are expert uh, of the model, so we can master many things uh, for the experimental setting. But the key point is the anticipation, because we need to pre-evaluate uh, the capacity of the drug of the vaccines. We need to run pilot studies. We need to assess the range of those that will be required. Uh, we need to, to pre-evaluate the quality of the immunogens uh, before we enter really in the uh, evaluation of the efficacy of the compounds. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you very much for that. Well, it looks like we've come to the end of the Q&A portion of the webinar. So I'd like to say thank you very much for those questions as we reach the end. Um, if we couldn't attend to your questions, the team at Oncone Design will follow up with you after this presentation. Now, if you have any further questions or inquiries, please utilize the email address that you see here on your screen, contact at oncodesign.com. And there's also a couple of phone numbers there for you to check out. And please go and check out their website, oncodesign.com. Now, a survey window, or actually, sorry, uh, thank you for everyone for participating in today's webinar. You will be receiving a follow-up email from X Talks with access to the recorded archive for this event. A survey window will be popping up on your screen, and your anticipation, or participation rather, it would be very appreciated as it will help us to improve on our further webinars. Now, I'm about to send you a link in a few seconds in your chat box. You'll be able to view the recording of this event with that link, and also share this link with your colleagues once they register for the recording. As well. So I encourage you to do that. Now, please join us in thanking our speakers, Nicola and Roger, for that very insightful presentation. So thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We hope you found this webinar informative. It has been my pleasure to be your webinar moderator. On behalf of the team here at X Talks, we thank you for joining us. I'm Sonia Hunt. Until next time, please take care and bye for now. Thank you again, Roger. Thank you again, Nicola. Bye, everyone.
Bye. Bye. Bye.